But thank you so much for taking this time to talk to us about uh, the kind of commitments that the Labour Party is prepared to make in terms of tertiary education. Um, we are asking you to pledge to support accessible and inclusive quality public tertiary education um, as that's set out in the new tertiary education strategy, uh, which we think has some very good aims in it, and also in the reforms of vocational education. And, but to make that vision live, we believe that you need to require a new funding model that prioritises domestic students and schools as those are required in Aotearoa, and which recognises the actual cost of running provision. Um, now, there is, you are committed to a, a, a revision of the funding model. Unfortunately, that's not due at the moment till the end of 2024. We're saying it needs to be finished by the end of 2021 to be in place by 2022. Are you prepared to commit to that kind of time frame for that new funding model? Well, obviously, the, the tertiary education strategy a, a, absolutely represents what the, the Labour Party stands for in terms of tertiary education. Um, you would expect that. You know, we, we, we've just finalised writing it. In terms of the funding model, We've started with the vocational education funding model and, and looking at that, um, and we are going to be uh, implementing that incrementally, so it's not necessarily going to be one big bang. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be looking over time at making sure that a new funding model is introduced. I think there's three things that we need to do with that funding model, and it's firstly looking at um, <coughs> funding delivery, so funding the costs of delivery uh, for, for programmes. The second is looking at the learner and making sure that we're supporting all of the learner's needs, recognising that there are some equity issues that institutions need to address that go beyond simply the cost of delivery, but actually supporting learners whose needs may be additional. And then the third thing that we need to do through the funding system is actually allow room for innovation and for, uh, for, for doing new things that may take a wee while to, you know, to scale up and so on. And the funding model um, is pretty good at doing the first, although it doesn't always meet the costs of delivery but doesn't always provide the right wraparound support for different groups of learners, and certainly doesn't uh, create the right incentives and the right room for innovation and for doing new things. So if we take that as being the basis of a new funding model, so looking at, well, let's make sure that we are actually meeting the costs of delivery, uh, that we are you know, providing extra support for learners who need that extra help, and that we are leaving room for innovation. We can be stepping towards that, making sure that additional funding that we're putting in is, is heading in that direction and is building up towards a new a new funding system by the beginning of 2022. Uh, look, I, 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 at this point, I can't put an absolute deadline on it, and one of the reasons for that is at this point we still don't yet know what we're dealing with in terms of COVID-19. We don't know how long the current COVID crisis is going to go on for, and what extra challenges that may throw up for us. So, uh, one of the things we have to be prepared for is. Uh, there are going to be parts of our economy and society that need ongoing support if we're dealing with COVID-19 for a longer period of time in order to keep things going, in order to make sure that we don't see big cutbacks in areas where none of us want to see big cutbacks. So uh, so our progress in tertiary education and, and the new funding model will to some extent uh, depend how long our, our COVID response has to go on for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we also think that to support that tertiary education strategy and road, that there needs to be an increase in funding in the tertiary edu education sector from to 2.7% of GDP by 2024. So that public funding covers the true cost of an accessible and inclusive system. What's your position on that? If you look at the, uh, the latest uh, OECD education of the class, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> it's got a very dry throat at the moment. It's been going like that for a couple of weeks now. <coughs> If you look at the latest OECD education at a glance statistics, they'll tell you that as a percentage of GDP, New Zealand is among the top spenders on education generally. And uh, we're always looking, of course, at where we can justify additional investment, and our government's not been afraid to do that. So introducing the first year free was a significant additional financial commitment from the government, uh, looking at additional financial support for students. Uh, looking at significant additional investment in vocational education, which we're seeing now with the uh, removal of fees for vocational education programs, the, the introduction of apprenticeship subsidies. So uh, there's no question that our government is committed uh, you know, to increasing the, the education slice of the pie overall. But we do need to build a case each time we go back to ask for more money, bearing in mind that we're in, this, we're in the lineup with health, with, uh, with, with social development, where there's significant financial pressures because of 
uh, COVID-19. So we're in, the, we're in the same queue as everybody else for additional funding. So we need to build the case for each new dollar that we're able to get. There is a special role for tertiary education, though, isn't there, in, in assisting the recovery of the overall economy? Oh, absolutely, and I think that you see that in the work that we're doing around the reform of vocational education, around the significant uh, emphasis that we put on increasing uh, funding to, to cater for increased demand for, for vocational education, for tertiary education generally. Um, and for, uh, for, for bringing together the on-the-job and the off-the-job training because uh, we know that we, we've had previously had a boom, boom and bust cycle um, with vocational education where the, the on-job apprentices, the ITOs, done very well when the economy is going good and then they, they really struggle when the economy turns down and the politics, the cycle is the opposite of that. So we've got to really get those two systems working together so that they're supporting education and learning wherever the economic cycle is. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we, we're also asking you to commit to removing unnecessary auditing measures from the sector, uh, and we, we can talk a bit more in detail about those if you'd like, but, and return that money to improve student support, which has been reduced over the last decade due to funding shortfalls. We're really seeing that lack of support for students, a, a bit of a crisis in the mental health and wellbeing of students. So one of the first things I did as Minister was remove the performance linked funding component from the, the tertiary funding system. It was adding no additional value, um, it was creating a huge degree of additional compliance and uncertainty for tertiary education providers that wasn't necessary. So um, I, I have no hesitation in signing off the removal of that, I think it was an experiment that failed. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very, very proud of our track record in that area. As we look, when we're looking at vocational education and the establishment of the New Zealand Institute of Skills and Technology, I think that we'll see a much greater degree of, uh, if you like, internal uh, compliance mechanisms in there rather than external compliance. So we're setting that up as an autonomous institution. We want them to have good, robust academic processes internally, um, and I think that that will actually reduce the level of external audit and compliance um, related costs that, that we see through the NZIC. Now it's going to take a few years to, to fully achieve that. But I think the key to that is a good high degree of staff engagement, staff ownership um, of that process within the NZIST so that they're de designing and developing a process, internal processes, that they're willing to stand behind and say, look, we actually think our internal processes are really robust and therefore we don't need all of these extra external compliance yeah. requirements. I think, I think we're also talking here about, I mean, you, you talk about decoupling the EPI from the funding, which is certainly a positive measure. Uh, but of course, in the crisis, you've said to institutions they don't need to meet that target of the percent surplus. Can you see that being extended, uh, that, that kind of permission, to not have penalties for undershooting or overshooting on enrolments? So we're always looking at how we can better streamline the, you know, the, the, the overall funding system. We did look at whether or not um, changing the funding requirements for this year um, we're justified and uh, we haven't made any further changes there because ultimately the way the funding system works at the moment is that potentially sets institutions up for a bigger hit next year if we were to do that. So what we've been looking at overall is, you know, are there further changes that can be made to the funding system? Uh, then absolutely that's a, that's, a, that's a possibility. We have geared up though to, to uh, fund exponential growth, you know, as, so we, sh you know, we do want to make sure that as institutions are expanding to cater in for, for increased domestic student demand, that we're not putting an arbitrary constraint on that. And so we have, mm. we have put money aside to cope with that extra growth. Yes, good. Um, now moving on to this question of equitable workplaces in the tertiary education sector. Um, are you committed to requiring all tertiary education providers who receive government funding to pay a living wage? and also to address inequality in the tertiary education sector by requiring all investment plans to include equity implementation plans for Māori women and Pacifica staff and learners and ensure that there's funding to achieve those plans. Sorry, two separate questions, but I thought <laughs> yeah. we're, I've, I've taken a lot of your time already. So That's all right. Look, with regard to the living wage, I think the, the Labour Party's pretty proud of our track record so far. We've started down this road. We know that we've got a way to travel yet before we really um, deliver on a, a, a fully living wage for, for those who are employed by the state, whether that's directly or indirectly. So we started with the core public service in our first year in government. We have been progressively expanding that out. So we see a living wage to all school support staff now that's been delivered. Um, we're seeing um, further progress in the health sector. 
Uh, and of course in tertiary education we do have a way to go there. So the government absolutely, or the Labour Party I should say, as part of the current government, is absolutely committed to the living wage. Um, it is going to take us a wee while longer to get to the living wage to everybody who's employed uh, in the public, the broader public sector, mm. uh, which includes the universities and polytechs. Uh, but we do want to do that. So uh, putting a time frame on that is difficult, uh, but absolutely we would like to see the living wage to all those employed by the state, whether directly or indirectly. In terms of equity, uh, of course we expect our tertiary education providers to have really good um, processes around making sure that their employment practices are equitable, that they're bringing on board staff who, who reflect the communities that they serve. And uh, I certainly wouldn't rule out um, additional um, reporting requirements, if you like, for the institutions to make sure that they're doing that. Um, that's not something that I've explored so far. Kia ora. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing that some of our members are, are looking at is the across the Tasman, there are numeric targets for yeah. students and staff in some tertiary institutions. Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, look, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule that out. I think one of the key things for us is making sure that any additional requirements that we put in place, first of all, didn't have a distortionary effect, because I'm aware that you know, targets can be gauged depending on how the targets are constructed. And we've certainly seen that in education in the past where you know you put targets in and you just create the wrong kind of incentives through targets. But I, I, I do think that affirmative action targets, that making sure that you know our tertiary education participation and staffing reflects our community um, are justified. So um, I certainly um, would be open to having that conversation. Great. Thank you so much for your time today, Minister. All the best for the election. Very good.